here, but it was uh, it was last week that Pastor preached on how to control anger that is out of control, and um, the Lord really used that in my life, and He taught me so much from that message. And it was uh, throughout the course of this past week that I was studying more on um, this subject of anger, because um, all throughout the Bible you have situations where people are getting angry all throughout the Bible there are people who are going to be angry and much the same all throughout our lives we are going to face people who are angry at us people who are angry around us or anger within ourselves and um, I was studying from Ephesians chapter 4 pastor preached from um, the book of Proverbs and he went through some different Proverbs on anger that was out of control that um, was addressed there but we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4 and um, I, the message that I'm going to preach tonight um, I thought I would share it with you. It was in the summer of, um, of 2016, and I remember I was, I was do, working or something one morning, and uh, there was a friend of mine who had done something, and it just made me so incredibly frustrated. And I think you can all relate. Where there's all a time in our life where we can just be so frustrated at the way someone is doing something or, or, or whatever, and it could be because our our own selfish desires are um, getting infringed upon, our agendas are not matching up with theirs, um, or it could be for a legitimate reason, um, what we would call righteous indignation, where we're upset at the fact that they're doing something wrong and um, we, we kind of in a way would justify our anger, and we have to be careful with that, but in this particular situation, I won't um, divulge into what it was, but uh, this friend was doing something, and um, it didn't really have to do with me, but it just frustrated the daylights out of me. And I was like, man, I really, it was someone I cared for, and I was like, I really want to, like, fix this. I want to find a solution. I want to use this energy within me to, to go forward in the right way. But I knew at the same time, um, anger is a tricky thing to deal with, because in our anger, we can often fend and hurt people and overstep a boundary that we definitely should not approach at all. And so um, that afternoon I was, I was free, and so I went to a Starbucks, and I opened the Bible, and I knew it said, you know, be angry, and said not. So I, I studied out that passage, and this message is kind of a result of that. It's just one I had um, followed up with. And oftentimes, I remember um, I went to West Coast Baptist College, and we had a guest pastor or preacher come and speak to us every single day throughout the week. And I remember there was one man, he was on staff, and he was preaching against anger. And I remember he said, there's no reason you should ever be angry ever and, it, and it's okay. And then I remember he quoted the verse, be angry and sin not. I was like, I, I don't think he realized what he just quoted, but the Bible tells us, be ye angry, hey, but sin not. So there's a line we know that our anger approaches. We know that we, we can be angry in the way of, hey, we're solving a problem, but when we approach the line of, hey, there's a, there's a line of sin. We can cross this line where, hey, we're offending others, we're, we're provoking others, we're doing something that is wrong, and that's where we're in sin. And um, we, we hear that often, but um, tonight I want us to look at a constructive view of our anger. And um, really we're getting a double header on the topic of anger. Pastor preached on, hey, what do we do when our anger is out of control? What do, what do we do about this? You know, and he, he, we looked at a few Proverbs, uh, but tonight I want us to look at what do we do to not get to that point? How do we stay away from the point where our anger is out of control and no longer useful to us? Because biblically we do understand that it can be um, and we're going to we're going to look at that um, in just a minute but um, one of the things that I often I often know about myself at least is often when we hear a message on on a topic like anger it can be kind of touchy or or just really any hot topic issue we can often leave the service saying well man um, man that person over there they weren't doing like the preacher said to do and um, I remember this situation where they did wrong and then they and we start looking at everybody else around us we start hey well they got angry at this or they're, they're wrong and they did this and they're wrong but that's not the point of the message the point of the message is tonight and we were, we were talking about this this morning in the college uh, Sunday morning class is is the point of the message is to be a mirror to ourselves I want us to all look inwardly let's let's take this message with introspection Let's look at our own lives and examine our own selves because it is through that that we're really going to make a difference. Because we can't control people around us, but we can control ourselves. And a verse that I often quote, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, is uh, Proverbs 14 and verse 8. And Proverbs 14 8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. Then the verse continues and it says, But the folly of fools is deceit. And essentially what that verse means is it says, Hey, a wise man, he's going to understand himself. He's going to be honest with himself. He's going to say, hey, when I look at myself in the mirror of God's word and I see something, some folly in my life, I'm going to be honest with myself. 
I'm going to be a wise man, and I'm going to get rid of that thing out of my life. And as we look at the topic of anger tonight, I want us to be that wise man. But the verse continues, it says, The folly of fools is deceit. And a fool will deceive himself by not being honest with himself. It means that when a fool has this folly, this sin, this vice in his life, but he, he says, oh, it's not, it's, not a big, it's not a big deal. It's no problem. I, I don't have to worry about that. He deceives himself, and he is unwise because of that. So tonight I want us to, um, to really focus on ourselves when it comes to this topic of anger. But Ephesians chapter 4, I'll read our text, and we'll get going. If I can turn to it first. Ephesians chapter 4, look in verse 26. In verse 26. Ephesians 4.26 reads this. It says, Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's bow for prayer one more time. Lord, again, um, we can't emphasize enough that we love you. We can't emphasize enough the fact that we are thankful tonight for the fact that you have forgiven us um, while we were yet sinners, Lord. And we, we, we want to worship you and open your word and um, follow you and seek you and be a disciple of you because of that. Lord, I pray tonight if there's anyone in the service who isn't saved, if there's anyone in the service who simply has a problem with anger, whether known or unknown, or they have some bitterness against someone else, Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart from your word, not from myself, um, and that we would be better because of it, and that we would make the correction as we need, and seek you, and confess that, and be restored to you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. One of the, um, one of the definitions for anger that I found to be the best is this of a biblical definition, that is, is that anger defined is the result of an emotion of passion and will that God has instilled in us to confront a problem and to seek a solution. Let me repeat that. Anger is the result of an emotion of passion, um, of energy, of volition uh, that God has instilled in us to confront a problem and to seek a solution. Like I said earlier, people say, hey, anger is wrong 100% of the time. Whereas the Bible tells us here, hey, be angry, but, but, but sin not. And we're going to look at how we do that. So it's the result of this emotion, this passion that we have been given in a way to, um, to, to, to see a problem, to see when something goes wrong, something makes us angry. Hey, how do, I, how do I confront this problem? How do I find a solution? How can I be the better for it, but also not enter into the realm where the Bible says, hey, I am sinning? Because we obviously know, like First John says, we do those things which are always pleasing in his sight. And we want to be pleasing to God. We, of course don't want to sin but one of the greatest misconceptions about anger is that like i said it is altogether to be avoided but biblically we can say that hey anger as it talks about in verse 31 where it says let all bitterness wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away from you hey yeah that is that is a sinful kind of an anger that we want to we want to steer clear of but anger in uh, verse 26 that it refers to it's talking about hey this will this emotion this passion that that wells up within us um, to, to find a solution, and, and we're going we're gonna to look at that. And I want to start off with an illustration that we see in the Bible about where there's a situation where, hey, this man becomes angry, and God gives him a choice of whether or not to, hey, to sin or to seek a solution. Because with our anger, we can do two things. And the, the, this will be the first point. We're not there yet, but we can, hey, we can follow the passion. We can follow the will. We can follow the emotion that God that God puts in us, and we can take that passion, and we can take that energy, and very quickly and concisely seek a solution because of it. Or we can do something else. We can follow the provocation. If I were to bump my hip on this pulpit, that would provoke me to be angry because who likes bumping their hip on anything? Who likes hitting their head when they get in a car? Who likes stubbing their toe? We're provoked to be angry. But when I follow after that which, um, that which I just want to attack at something, I just want to flip the pulpit because it, it made me angry. No, that there, those are two different types of anger, two differences of anger that we don't want to approach that. But um, in Genesis chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. We find Cain and Abel. And Cain was a man who we can see from his uh, very short uh, mention in the Bible. He was a man who was angry. And so we have Cain and Abel, and their story starts and kind of ends all in the same passage. And what happens? Cain and Abel both take their offerings. They both take the thing that they work on. Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
and Abel was a shepherd. He watched after lambs and flocks and all these other things. And they took the fruit of their labors and they brought them to God. And they presented both of them as a sacrifice to God. And it says that God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice, the lamb, and he wasn't pleased with Cain's. Well, it was, it was honestly, it was an honest mistake. Cain was giving the fruit of the ground, and we know that from Genesis chapter 3, hey, the ground was cursed. It was cursed because of sin, and God won't tolerate sin. He won't accept sin. But we see the lamb, and God accepted the lamb. Why? Because the lamb was a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the lamb of God. So here we have Cain is now mad. Why? Because he made a mistake. He's mad because God didn't accept his sacrifice like he had accepted Abel's. And it says that uh, his countenance fell, and he was very wroth. So in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 4, it says, The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So here we have God confronting and talking to um, an angry Cain. Cain is mad, he's wroth, his countenance has fallen, he's, get, he's getting depressed, he's getting bitter, and he's angry at this situation, but he is not seeking a solution. And what does God say to him? He's saying, hey, why are you mad right now? All you have to do is you have to follow after the solution, do the right thing, and what's going to happen? You will do well. But he says, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. See, I don't believe at this point Cain had done anything wrong. Because God, they didn't know from God how to, how to make a sacrifice. God hadn't told them. They didn't have the book of Genesis. They didn't have any of the law at that point. So they, he had made an honest mistake. But what was Cain's problem? Cain's problem was his pride. Because Cain wanted to give up what he had been working hard on, whereas Abel gave up what he had been working hard on. And, and God was showing us a picture of, hey, of, of Jesus and of sin. And while God showed that picture, he said, hey, Cain, you're, me and you are fine right now. You just gotta, you just gotta do the right thing. But what did Cain do? Cain didn't say anything to God. In verse eight it says, "And Cain went and talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and he slew him." So what happens to Cain? Cain takes his anger, and instead of following after the solution, taking that passion and finding a solution, finding a, finding an end result that results in good, he takes his anger. And he takes it out on Abel. And the first murder in the Bible, the first murder in the history of the world happened. Why? Because a man had anger and he misdirected it in a way that was sinful. And the fact of the matter is, is that when we as people do not control our anger, we in turn allow our anger to control us. And that's the baseline is when we do not control our anger, we allow our anger to control us. It was, um, it was October 8th of this year formerly known as Friend Day to Bible Baptist Church. And um, uh, our good friend Jonathan, he, uh, he got about 50 people signed up for the college class. And I think 30 of them showed up, uh, or right under 30. Some of them drove in. But we had, we had right under 50 people total in our college ministry. We normally have about 15 to 20. So that was big. You know, we wanted to have all these people for Friend Day. So I think Jonathan, he wins the award for um, having the most, people, the most friends come, about 30 on Friend Day. But um, we, we have a 15-passenger van. It's an old van. It's top-heavy. It's kind of rickety. And um, we knew we couldn't put 30 people in a, in a van. So me and Brad Davis, we drove up to Bob Jones University that morning, and he took the IRIX uh, old white van, and he's, he's driving in that van, and I'm following, um, or I'm actually in front of him in the red van, and we, we both drive up to Bob Jones. And there were so many kids outside. People were like, hey, where, where are you guys going? Because they saw this big group of people. And we load up uh, the Dirk's white van or the Irix white van, and Brad takes off on that, and that thing is shaking as we're going down the road full of all these people. And then I load up the red van, and it's me plus 14. But what I didn't know at the time, I didn't know that they don't make those vans anymore. And there's a good reason they don't make the vans anymore. It's because they're top-heavy, and they're highly dangerous. And there's no school that's allowed to use them. There's no public school or Christian school that's allowed to use them or nursery you're just not allowed. They may make like small shuttle buses and short, short buses and all that stuff today. But what happened was, is we had four of the biggest guys that we brought on the van on the very back row. If you don't know anything about those vans, is here's the tire, here's the back axle, and then here's the back row. And uh, my girlfriend was actually telling me in New Jersey, it is illegal, like 100% just against the law to put anybody on that back row. Because people in New Jersey, they know a thing or two about ice and water on the road, and that when you have a heavy van in the back that's going down an icy road, your van's going to pull up some. 
Um, but here's what happened. There was, um, we put 13 people in the van. We had one more spot. And there was, a, there was a student whose name was, I think his name was Robin. And Robin got on the wrong van and went to the wrong church. So he goes to Faith Baptist Church in Taylor's, I think. So we drive up to Taylor's. We're going to, oh, bless God, we'll pick Robin up and bring him to church. So we drive up the hill to uh, Faith Baptist Church out in Taylor's, and it had just started to rain that morning. And it was a cold, kind of a nasty morning. But um, we were doing it, and we'd go up, drive up to the church. We'd pick Robin up. we get him in the van. Uh, he goes to the back with everybody else, and then we're driving down the hill. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to Faith and Taylor's, but they have kind of a, it's not super steep, but it's a driveway that's kind of curvy, and it goes up to the church. And, um, and there was a sign, I remember, in the, at the church, and it said, you know, posted 15 miles an hour. I was probably going like 20 or something, but, you know, it, it all feels slow, kind of under 45, right? And we're just cruising along. And then all of a sudden, I just remember, I'm driving the van, and I think Jonathan or Kenny was right there. Or no, Kenny wasn't there that morning, but um, and I just feel the van start to turn. And the whole back of the van turns, and we're now sliding down this driveway on the side. And, and, and what's the number one thing you're not supposed to do when you hydroplane? Someone say it. Slam on the brakes. And guess that's what I did. I just slammed on the brakes as hard as I could because it, it freaked me out, you know. Um, and I slam on the brakes, and I'm barely controlling this thing. And we're just sliding down this driveway, and, we're, and everyone just is dead quiet in the van. We're all just like, we don't know what's going to happen. And so then we come up, and we come up to a curb. And the curb on the, the driveway it wasn't like a road. It was kind of like we have out here in our driveway. It was a big square. And we hit the side of the curb with this van. And we pop up on it, and then we pop up on it again, and we're sliding kind of halfway on the road and halfway on the grass. And then there's an oak tree, and we're coming straight up to this oak tree, and we stopped about four inches in front of this oak tree. If it, if it had rained earlier and the grass was muddy, we would have, that van would have been gone. Um, and we found out later that we, uh, we bent, the, bent the axle on it. We bent the frame on it when we hit that curb. It still drives kind of funny even today, but, um, but, but the, lesson, the lesson that I learned on that day is, hey, we, at, at, at some point, is we were not in control of that van. Why? We, we lost control of the van because the van was now under the control of what? It was under the control of the circumstances. It was under the control of the weight of itself. And the weight of the van, the gravity, it just took it right along on top of that, that water and oil slick. And me breaking, you know, that wasn't helping anything. Um, it, it, and we, we wrecked the van, in a sense. And the fact of the matter is, is that us as people, when we lose control of our anger and we come under the weight of our anger, the weight of the passion and the will to, to find a solution, but we misdirect it, what happens? That anger is now controlling us. And so tonight I want us to see four key steps, uh, four key steps from this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 that we can make to control our anger so that our anger does not get the best of us. So look back to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, um, and verse 26. Uh, the first, that first clause in there, it says, be ye angry, be ye angry. And the first point of the message is follow the passion, follow the passion. And I know that this can be kind of a, a touchy subject before, you know, you guys walk out and say, hey, Alexander's telling us to be angry at people. That's, that's not it at all. Like I said before, um, anger, it's a passion. It's, um, it's a will. It's an emotion that God gives to us to, hey, say, Man, this solution, it's frustrating the daylights out of me. It's making me mad. And there's something that's not right right here. There's something that is wrong in this situation. And feeling the anger, knowing the anger, since we have been provoked by the situation in whatever capacity, we're to take that passion and we're not to subdue it and we're not to bottle it up and just say, okay, I just need, I just need to stop, I just need to stop. We're to take that passion and, hey, I'm not going to misdirect this at a person. I'm not going to misdirect this in an ungrateful attitude or in a sinful way, but I'm going to take that will, that energy that God has given to me, and I'm going to take that and direct it at what? At finding a solution. Because when, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been angry. Um, obviously, you all have been angry at some point or another. But when, when you're angry, you, you, your mind starts moving. And you start moving at a, a thousand miles an hour. And like, what am I going to do? I'm just going to, uh, uh, and you're just thinking, how am I going to solve this situation? And that is, I, I don't want to say a symptom, but that is a way um, of the will, the energy that God has given to us. Our mind is now moving. Our, we're thinking, we're, we're trying to move towards a solution. But where do we go wrong? Where do we go wrong? There's a passion, an emotion, a feeling that I have inside of me as well as a will, a volition to do what is right. That's in my soul. We know biblically our soul is made up of what? It's made up of our mind, the way we think, 
our emotions, how we feel, as well as our will, mind, will, and emotions. Our will is what we want to do. And anger affects all of these areas. But the biggest problem of us and our anger when we do follow a passion is, hey, we're taking this passion, this emotion that is inside of us, and like people used to say, I don't think they say it anymore, it's like we're seeing red. We see red. We're, we're just so angry and we're so passionate and we're so mad where we go from being angry and we go from taking that passion to just being mad. And we're just mad. And we just see this emotion and we get lost in our passion and we start attacking other people and we start doing this or that. It's like I said, I don't know if you guys have ever woken up in the middle of the night to, to get a glass of water, go to the bathroom or whatever, and you bump, your, bump yourself on a table or you're getting into your car and you smack your forehead or anything like that. And when I hit something, uh, not with a vehicle, but with my, myself, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm not expecting to hit it, that just drives me insane. And I just, that ticks me off. And my first thought is, I just want to flip this table over. I, it, it just, I just well up and then I'm like, okay, calm down. It's not big, and then I just keep moving. And what, I, what should I do? I should say, hey, maybe I should just move this table over. But that's a difference between, hey, I'm being mad and I'm being provoked and I'm going to follow after that provocation or no, I'm going to take my passion. I'm going to take the will and the energy that God has given to me and I'm going to find a solution because of that. And when we as people come to the point where we, we just have anger and we just have passion and I'm just going to misdirect that at a person. And my, my, my problem is a person and I'm just going to tell them what I think about them. And I'm going to do what in verse 31 it says, I'm just going to be bitter for a while. I'm just going to be wrathful for a while. I'm just going to clamor. I'm going to speak evil. I'm going to gossip. But no, the Bible says, hey, we need to put away those things, but be ye angry and sin not and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. As a child, I, um, I honestly, I used to think that neither let the sun go down upon your wrath. And we'll, we'll get to that. But I, I used to think that that was like, a, not like a proverb from the book of Proverbs. I thought it was like a Benjamin Franklin proverb, you know, like you just hear people say, hey, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Go make sure this is fixed. Like, you know, early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. I thought it was one of those kind of things. But then I see it's in the Bible. And the way I always pictured it is, um, I'm not married yet, but I always pictured it as a husband and wife. They're, they're sitting in bed and they're arguing. And then they just both turn their separate ways and they let the sun go down upon their wrath. And that Paul imagined, you know, a 21st century couple arguing and then going their separate ways but and essentially you could apply that but what it's saying is why neither let the sun go down upon your wrath why essentially is it saying that is because it's saying hey the passion that we feel it's eventually going to go away but let's take that passion before the sun goes down come to a solution come to a compromise and i'm going to follow that to the point where the problem is now solved or i have done some positive some constructive steps to solving this problem. So that's why it says, be ye angry and sin not. We need to follow the passion. We don't need to attack the person. Uh, the book of James says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness which is of God. We need to follow the passion, but don't aggress the situation. Don't make the situation worse because of yourself. That is a sinful anger. We need to follow the passion, but don't, um, as someone say, arrest your soul. Don't take your don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, as Romans 6 would say. Um, Proverbs 25, Steve, that's what Pastor Steve preached on it last week. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. We need to stay in control of ourselves or what's going to happen. Anger is going to get the better of us. Um, let's go to point number two. Follow the passion. Not only follow the passion, we need to do what? We need to do the hardest part, which is forgive the people forgive the people it says be ye angry and sin not and many of you in here may be thinking of a certain problem maybe thinking of a certain thing in your head that man that was the last thing that made me angry and a lot of you may be thinking alexander that's that's real simple and all but you guys just don't understand my problem is a person and my life is just filled with people who are problems to me and what do you do when the person that is in your life or the problem that is in your life is in fact a person. Well, the Bible tells us this in verse 32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And that is something that is very easy to say from a pulpit, but it is very hard to live in everyday life. Why? Because feelings are hard things to get past. And hurt is a hard thing to get past. And when we are offended, that is a hard thing to overcome and say, hey, I forgive you. I'm going to choose to live with the consequences of your sin in my life, even as God did for me, but I forgive you. Um, 
it was it was back in this is an illustration it was back in 2015 I spent the last four years of my life in a dorm um, in California at, at West Coast and uh, my junior year was probably my hardest year because I had I had taken all my Greek classes early but I was finishing them up and you know as a pastoral major you got to take you know Greek one through four so four semesters of Greek that'll that'll definitely be a problem for you but um I was that it was that year I was rooming with two of my best friends and it was sweet and we were we were excited you know we, we kind of had a, a hookup with the staff where we could be like hey you know me Caleb and Diego let's all room together and and it was really cool for about the first week until we realized that hey um, when you room it, when you room with somebody it's kind of good to room with somebody who you don't yet know because at that point you you now don't we had an expectation is what I'm trying to say I expected you know my best friend Diego my best friend Caleb we're all rooming together and we're all boys and we're just we're just ready to have like a great year and we had some expectations and we, we overlooked the flaws in each other but when you live with somebody it is so easy to see flaws in people it's just like man it's just there you know you you see that and it was um it was the spring it was the spring of 2016 actually and I was I was in Greek 4 and I had a, so many projects and I was up late every night just typing away at these projects and um, there's something about myself my dad and my brother but we just type incessantly loud I don't know what it is we just bang on this thing like Jacob playing the piano and um, and, and I was just, I was typing one night, and I didn't know this, um, but Diego, who, he's my best friend, he was, he was going through something in his life. It was a personal situation. And um, he was laying in his bed, and I'm, I'm sure he was just thinking about it. Caleb was just, he was just watching a movie like he always did. Um, but I'm, I'm there typing a Greek 4 project, and, um, and I just hear Diego say from his top bunk, I'm just, he's just like, can you please stop? And I was just like, <laughs> whoa, bro, it's, it's 12 at night, like. Maybe you should just go to sleep. But he wasn't being able to sleep because I was typing so loud. So I start typing really softly. And then he just keeps saying stuff. Like lay, he's just laying down in his bed and he's just saying stuff. And it is making me so angry and so annoyed. After the fact that I had already annoyed him, I guess, with my piano fingers on the keyboard. And, um, and he just gets mad. And then finally I'm like, man, I have to do this project. I can't go out in the hall right now. I'm not a senior. Because if you're a senior, you know, you can stay up kind of whenever you want to. Um, but I just stand up and I'm like, dude, what is your problem? And as soon as I stand up, it provoked him. And he jumps down off his top bunk and he gets in my face. And then right as he did that, someone walks in. And I think it could have been a lot worse had someone not walked in. But then the, someone walks in and is being just so obnoxious at midnight in our dorm. And you college students probably know, I guess it's like that at Bob Jones, unless it's stricter. I don't know. But um, And then he starts yelling at that guy. And then I'm, I'm yelling at him, and then Caleb's yelling at him, and we're all, just, we're all just yelling at each other, and we're all just attacking each other. And he provoked me, and he provoked him, and, and what are we doing? We're taking our anger, and we're just pointing it at other people, and we're just attacking other people, and we're offending other people. And, and I remember that, that just bothered me so much, because it's one thing when you're driving down the road and someone cuts you off and you beep at them and they give you the middle finger outside of their window and you don't know the guy and you're just like man that made me mad but it's another thing when it's someone you care about and they really make you mad and they offend you that you offend them and your conscience is hurt because you know you did wrong and you know that they did wrong to you but what do you do you forgive them anyways why because while we were yet sinners what happened Christ died for us and Christ still showed us love, and he still showed us forgiveness, despite the fact that we have sinned against him, despite the fact that we were born in sin and that we continually sin. What did Jesus do? Hey, he forgave us. And when I'm gonna, if I'm going to take my anger, and I'm going to use it constructively, I'm going to use it positively, what am I not going to do? I'm not going to be bitter at the person. I'm not going to be wrathful at the person. I'm not going to hold a grudge against the person. Why? Because I'm going to forgive them. Because it's commanded, but also because, hey, God has forgiven me. I had such a sin debt stacked against heaven, but what did God do? He said, hey, I'm going to send my son to die for you and to forgive your sins and to take away the penalty of your sins so that, hey, you can have a relationship with me so that I can show you kindness upon kindness and goodness upon goodness. And to end this story, I, I guess I kind of left you guys hanging with that, but um, it, was a, it was a Friday night that that happened. And Diego, he was, he was actually working as an assistant pastor while in college, and he went away for the weekend. And so it bothered me all weekend long. And I would rather, it's kind of like when you're a kid and your parents are like, hey, you want to be spanked or do you want to be grounded? And you're just like, spanked.
spank me now and let me go play. You know, it's just kind of like you would rather settle the situation than let the situation linger, you know. And the, but the situation lingered all throughout the, um, all throughout the weekend. And I remember we were having a room leader meeting because I was, you know, someone's in charge. I was in charge of the room. Um, and, and he came back up the stairs, and I kind of saw him, and we made eye contact. And then I, and I, just went and, I just went and said, hey, dude, I'm sorry, man. Like, please forgive me. I, I know I was annoying you. And he was just like, dude, I was going through something. It's fine. And we forgave each other. But it could have, A, been a lot worse. And, B, we could have, I don't know, it just, it just could have been a lot worse. It's plain and simple. But what do we do? We forgive the person. So if I'm going to take my anger constructively, hey, I need to follow the passion. But use it in the right way. I need to forgive the people. But also, thirdly, focus on the problem. Focus on the problem. And I know that's kind of a, a weird thing to say in church, too. We hear a lot of tri- messages on trials and different things. And it says, hey, don't focus on your problem. Don't focus on this and that. Focus on God. But we're talking about finding a solution to a problem. We're talking about something has gone wrong. Something's gone awry. And I'm going to take my passion, my will, my energy and I'm going to get this thing right. So what, what do I do? I'm not going to focus on this person. And sometimes if it is a person, you just got to give it to the Lord. And I know that's almost a trivial thing to say, but it's true. You just have to commit that to God. But in generally speaking, we need to focus on the problem. The problem with our anger is that we want to take that, and like me and Diego and Caleb are doing, we just want to attack everybody around us. But what we sometimes need to do is we just need to take a step back, get a cool head, and we need to take our anger, take the passion. The passion is still going to be there, and we need to focus upon the problem. But I'm not just saying that. It's in the Bible. Um, look but down at verse 26 again. It says, be angry, take the, follow the passion, and sin not, forgive the people. And it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And um, the, the, way to, the way to look at that essentially is, is to say, hey, if God has given me um, a passion, a will, and energy to solve a problem, I need to do that before the day ends. And why? Is there something like mystical or special about the day? Um, let me illustrate it for you. Um, yesterday, I was so pumped up and so energized and so just ready to preach this message. Um, I was telling Miss Marguerite, I was like, I am so ready to preach this message. I'm angry. And it's just like, I'm almost angry. I'm so hyped up to preach it. And, um, and I, was, I, was, I, I was getting ready for bed. And I'm like, man, I was calling Grace. And I was like, I'm so excited about this message and telling her different parts about it and just... Um, what the Lord was showing me throughout the day, and I, I worked on it all yesterday. Um, and I, and I, I went to bed, and I just kind of laid there because I was like, I'm so excited to preach this message. Um, but then it was like I was just laying there. I was kind of awake, and then I looked at the clock, and it was like 12. Like I just went to bed at 9, and it's already 12. And, and I don't know if you guys have ever been really hyped up one day, and then you wake up the next and you go to bed late, and you're like, well, I'll, I'll still be hyped up tomorrow. I'm so, uh. And then I woke up this morning, and I could not have been more tired and more just like, let me just sleep until noon, um, until Christmas comes, and then I'll be good to go. But um, essentially, that, that's kind of a true thing. Like, we often feel different from day to day to day. So uh, that's a good, important reason why we don't follow our feelings. Why? Because feelings fluctuate on and off and on and off. And just as the sun rises, we can feel different each and every day. And when I get angry, let's go back to the illustration of a couple in bed just sitting there arguing. When, when they're angry at each other and when they're angry at a situation and you're not doing this and you're not doing this and they're bickering back and forth, what do they need to do? They need to take a cool head. They need to forgive each other. But the problem comes is when we don't let our anger, when our anger, it just goes unresolved because that's us setting ourselves up for bigger problems. Because like we said earlier, anger it, it affects all of us. It affects our body. We see red. I don't. I don't think we actually see red, but we get. You know, we get our our face gets red, and we get just nervous and sweaty, and we're just like, ugh. We're angry, but it affects our soul most importantly. It affects our mind. Affects our heart. Affects our will. And when we let that anger stay there, and then we go to sleep, and we're just like, I'll just deal with it later. What's going to happen? We're going to wake up the next morning feeling a little differently, and that energy the passion, the will that we had to be angry, not at the person, but to to go forward. I'm going to fix this situation. I'm going to solve this solution. That energy, it's probably not going to be there anymore. But what is going to be there? That sinful type of anger, that wrath that we have towards that person. Because when we look at our problems and we just see a person and we say, that's my problem right there. 
Instead of, and, and it could be a problem. I understand that people often are problems in our lives. But when we take our anger, we don't fix it. We don't get through it. We don't deal with it. Come to a compromise. Come to a good situation. What's going to happen? We're going to wake up the next morning thinking it's her problem. It's her fault. And what's going to happen? If we don't deal with it, if we don't deal with it as soon as possible, if we don't seek that solution as soon as we ought to, what's going to happen? We make room for bitterness. That's why in verse 31, it brings it back up. It says, now let all bitterness and wrath and anger. It says, hey, it's time to put all this anger away. You clearly can't handle it. And clamor, that's like gossip. Is that that gossip, brother? Yeah, that's gossip. And evil speaking, that's also gossip. Be put away with you with all malice. And now be kind one to another. So what is it essentially saying? It is saying that, hey, if you let your anger go unresolved and you don't forgive people, you don't find a solution, you don't take your anger and be proactive about it, eventually you're just going to not see a problem anymore and you're going to be looking at that person and you're going to be bitter against that person and you're going to say hey that's my problem hey i can't believe they did this hey i can't believe diego yelled at me i can't believe this or this or this happened and now you're going to be bitter against that person and you have a bigger problem altogether and that problem is now yourself that problem is now the the room for bitterness that you have made in your heart and when we let situations go and dealt with we will become bitter so I ask you tonight, is there, is there a situation, is there a person in which you have, in which you're bitter against them? In which there's, hey, we're not, we're, we don't talk anymore. You know, we, we just don't talk anymore. They, they did this and they did this and I'm done with them now. And you just don't know the hurt that they've caused me and you don't know this and, and we're done with them now. But is that, is that the Christian way? Is that the biblical way? No, there's always restoration and reconciliation and forgiveness despite the stack of sin that they may have given to you. So we know that we need to follow the passion. We need to forgive the person. We need to focus on the problem and away from the person. But last of all, we need to forsake the pride. Forsake the pride. Look in verse 27. We're almost done. We need to forsake the pride. Verse 27 of the Bible reads, Neither give plays to the devil. You might say, hey, um, did you just not have an alliteration for P, for Satan? No, I did. It says, well, let's look at what it's actually saying. It says, neither give plays to the devil. When it says give place to the devil, essentially what the Bible is saying, what God is saying is saying, hey, your own sin gives Satan a foothold in your life. We know that um, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, it tells us that we have a besetting sin. We have a sin that we naturally fall to. There's something, it could be anger, it could be lust, it could be um, greed, all these different vices in our life. And we all have a besetting sin, but pride in particular is the, the greatest foothold that Satan can get a place to stomp on your life. Uh, Pastor Steve, he often says pride is always the problem. He has a message about it. And we know that pride in any sin in our life is always the problem. You look at the root of a, root of a sin, it goes back to pride. It goes back to me trying to get my selfish desires across, me trying to get my agenda across. And what do we need to do? We need to forsake the pride in our life. Paul tells us, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And essentially what he's saying is he's saying, hey, the devil is after you tonight, and he's after you on the grounds of you. The devil is after us based upon the fact that, hey, he is going to step on your life. He's going to take a foothold in your life and begin to build up a stronghold in your life, not based on something he's putting in your life. Sure, he can tempt you, but he is going to build strongholds in your life based upon your own pride and it is in our anger and in our pride that we we want to we want to fly off the handle because it takes pride to fly off the handle and start yelling at somebody it takes pride to build up bitterness in our life against somebody it takes pride not to reconcile a relationship with somebody it takes pride to have a pity party and say hey i'm not going to forgive that person it takes pride to say hey you don't know what they've done to me it takes pride to hurt others it takes pride to take our anger and say hey you you don't know what you've done to me You need to stop doing this. You need to stop doing that. I don't like that. You're wrong. It takes pride. And at the end of the day, pride is always the problem. But we're creating a bigger problem for ourselves when we start to live in our anger and sin against others. We're we're, we're creating a way for Satan to have access to our lives. We're giving him foothold in our lives when we take our pride and say, hey, we're basically saying, hey, Satan, why don't you come on and step in my life? You see all the pride that I have? And we think that we're taking our anger and we're, we're pointing it at a person. And we're offending a person. We think, hey, this is going to be better for me in the long run. But what are you actually doing? 
you're hurting somebody else. You're offending somebody else when you could have had some Holy Spirit in you and you could have said, hey, I'm going to take a spiritual approach to this. But no, we're taking our anger and we're letting our pride well up within us to the point where we're, what are we doing? We're only aggressing the situation. We're only making the situation worse. And essentially what we're doing is we're not inviting the Holy Spirit of God to let us be spirit-filled. We're inviting Satan to take hold in our life. And when God tells us, neither give place to the devil, what is he saying in your life? He's saying, hey, that pride that you have in your life, that pride that is going to be a stronghold in your life, you need to take that and you need to cast that down. Or Satan is going to come in your life and he is going to step all over you. So I ask you again tonight, what anger do you have in your life? What anger do you have towards another person? The gossiping, the inner bitterness towards other people, the wrath, the malice, all of these things we take and we, we hold them and we build them up in our lives. And what are we not doing? We're not being godly at all. We're not taking verse 32 and saying, hey, you know, I'm just going to be kind to this person. I'm just going to be kind to them for a while, even though they're offending me. I'm just going to love my enemies for a little bit. I'm just going to be tender hearted towards this person and I am going to forgive them as God has forgiven me. What happened to that? But even us as Christians, we see things in the church that we don't like. We see people doing something that we don't like, even though they're just as much a sinner as we are. And we get angry at them and we start gossiping about them behind their back and we start doing this or doing that or Facebook stuff. I don't even have a Facebook, so I don't, I don't know how that goes. But we, we do all of these things and what are we doing? We're just putting a target on our backs and saying, hey, Satan, I got a lot of pride over here. Why don't you come step all over my life? And we're just inviting Satan to bring more temptations and to bring more problems into our life. And what, uh, the Bible tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Carnal means flesh. Carne asada, can I get an amen to carne asada? That's flesh. That's meat. That's what we are made of. And while we live in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And when we take in our flesh our anger that God has given, not, not that God has given to us, but the anger that we feel we take these things and say, I'm just going to take it in my flesh, and I'm just going to start attacking a person for a little while. Hey, that's not of God. But when we take the anger, the passion, the will to actually solve the problem, the, the, the anger that is in my soul, hey, I'm going to take this, and with a spiritual mindset, I'm going to confront a problem. I'm going to follow the passion, but I'm not going to provoke this person. I'm going to be provoked, but I am not going to provoke again. So let me ask you guys, what anger is in your life that may not even be visible. What anger is in your life that's seen through bitterness? It's seen through wrath. It's seen through malice. All of these different areas that you just need to, hey, I, I just need to give that to God. I need to confess that to God. I need to confess that to the person. I need to restore my relationship with this person. I need to ask for forgiveness for the fact that, hey, I've said this to this person. I was disrespectful to this person. I offended this person. What is in your life tonight that we need to forsake, that we need to get out of our lives. Um, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's go ahead and stand. You might be in here tonight.